Now, out of all the visions I've ever heard about the end time, I'm about to tell you the most startling one. It's so startling that I had to contact the person because it's like he, he just disappeared off the map. I know that he has a ministry, but he just hasn't said anything. And it turns out that he, he saw this vision in 1980. 1980, that's more than 30 years ago. And he preached about it once in 2005 and apparently never again. And so I emailed and got confirmation that he still stands by this vision. He's not recanted on this vision. Um, and he doesn't seem to have much to add to this vision. All right? But we have something to add because we see the fulfillment of many prophetic uh, scriptures. And so I want to explain it to you and bring this to you kind of in a fresh and updated version. Obviously, you can go and listen to the old version. That would be fine. I think it goes on for you know, more than two hours. So we're going to do a, a synopsis of it. His name is Ken Peters. This is what he looked like in 1980. Obviously, he would be, you know, more than 30 years older now. But that's what he looked like. And that was the recording at Prophecy Club in 2005. This man at that time, referring back to 1980, uh, was not a born-again Christian. He said that by his own description, he was a Catholic but he had no knowledge of the scriptures, no knowledge of the end times. He w had no bias for or against any doctrinal position, so he was an ideal person for God to reveal this to, and uh, neither did he have the new birth experience. Right? He knew about God, but he had not yet been born again. Uh, after he had this vision, about, I think, a couple of weeks after this vision, he did accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, the question is, when you see this kind of um, vision, when you hear this reporting, the question you've got to ask is, how do you authenticate this? How do you verify this is true? Well, first, whatever he says must not disagree with the Bible. Amen? A lot of people say, well, it's not in the Bible, so therefore it's wrong. Well, wait a second. You can't say that. You know, there, there's no requirement in the Bible for you to obtain a driver's license. That's not in the Bible. And yet, that is not anti-Bible, is it? Yeah, it's okay for you to pass a driver's license test and then be able to drive legally on the roads. It's not in the Bible, right? But the general principle is there that you obey government and authority. Okay, so what we want to look for is there should be nothing that disagrees or contradicts the Bible. And I listen to this many times over and over, and I don't find anything that contradicts the Bible. And number two, we want to look for accurate predictions. Right? It doesn't contradict the Bible, but it goes beyond. It mentions details and things that we haven't yet fully seen in the Bible. We just want to make sure that they're accurate. So that's what I want to show you first. Is this a credible vision? The vision begins, this was a dream, the vision begins when Ken Peters heard a loud, what he described as a loud car horn. Remember, he speaks in very secular terms. He's not a theologian. He's not, you know, trained. He doesn't know the shofar blast on Yom Teruah. He doesn't know that, okay? So please, there are a lot of very critical people out there, keyboard warriors, give the man a break. Starts out saying something that is in the Bible, but in different words. He hears a loud car horn. Then he saw graves bursting open here and there. He said literally there were small explosions. He saw cemetery plots. One would explode, the dirt would fly out, the other one next to it, maybe husband, wife, the other one stayed. Nothing happened. He said there was no pattern to it, just everywhere, boom, 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 boom. Plots were exploding. So just imagine that, okay? Then he saw people coming out of the graves in shining robes. He said that they all had robes on, and they shone brighter than the sun. The people looked young. He said anyone who lost their hair got their hair. Lost their teeth, got their teeth back. Whatever defect or deformity or flaw there was, everything was corrected and reversed in age. And yet the people looked mature. He said the men, even though they were wearing robes, looked very masculine. He said the men looked more masculine. And the women 
look more feminine. He said it didn't matter that they were wearing robes. I guess he's saying they look young and they look attractive. Men are men, women are women. Interesting start to the vision. He saw millions of people disappearing instantly. He says, however, that um, what, he, what he saw definitively is a term that I, I want to introduce, a pre-tribulation resurrection of the dead. There is no question that he saw a pre-tribulation resurrection of the dead. Those who died in faith were resurrected prior to the tribulation starting. There is absolutely no question to that. Now what he says is he didn't see the rapture of the living saints. And there may be various reasons for that, all right? But he didn't see. Obviously, he's not going to see everything in one vision. And at that time, this would, might have been an information overload for him. But he saw the dead rise pre-tribulation. So what can we gather from this? Is this vision biblical so far? Well, compare it to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. It's uh, almost verbatim and in sequence. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. There's the car horn. That trump is a shofar blast. It's the 100th shofar blast during Yom Teruah or the uh, New Year for the Jewish calendar. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Who goes first? Those who have died in Christ. They died believing in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I think this answers very definitively when the rapture takes place. Here we have now evidence of a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I didn't say it's exclusively pre-tribulation. I believe that the mid-tribulation mid gets a rapture, the post tribulation gets a rapture. There are raptures everywhere, but there is a rapture at pre-tribulation for sure because it happens along with the pre-tribulation resurrection of the dead. If the rapture doesn't occur at pre-tribulation, that means that those who are dead in Christ and get resurrected will be separated from those who are alive and remain and are supposed to get raptured. But the Bible says very clearly in 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 4, that we who are alive and remain get caught up together. Now, how can we be together if we are three years apart, seven years apart, or even more? Cannot be. So if this vision is correct, there's a pre-tribulation resurrection of the dead, we who are alive go together with them in the air. Ooh, it's exciting. It's pretty good. There's further evidence of pre-tribulation rapture occurring even though Ken Peters himself may not subscribe to it. That's the interesting thing, and you find that a lot about Revelation. When people get Revelation, even the prophets themselves don't always fully understand everything that they receive. So that's not a sign of it being a bad vision. That's just a sign of the fact that everyone is free to interpret the Scriptures, visions, dreams, revelations according to their own personal interpretation and biases. We must try as best we can to compare with Scripture, but everyone has a bias. That doesn't make them false, it just makes them human. Yeah? So I think that Ken Peters is probably, at that time, not really convinced about the pre-tribulation rapture. However, he continues to give details that confirm a pre-tribulation rapture. He says he saw an unusual thing during the tribulation. Now, we don't know how many years he's there seeing, you know, what length of time he saw, but he said... He saw something unusual. There were no babies and no children over the age of two. That's very interesting. That's an interesting detail. What happened? Because prior to the tribulation, there would have been two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. There would have been babies that were one month old, two months old, right? There would have been uh, ten-year-old, twelve-year-olds. Where are all the children? Well, we believe that when the rapture occurs, everyone who knows God knows Jesus Christ, goes up together. And so all the Christians go up, and all the children who are below the age of accountability, they have not yet chosen immorality. They have not chosen to live in sin and spite God and reject His Son, Jesus Christ. All those children are saved. When children die, they go to heaven. They don't go to hell. No child goes... All the visions of people who go to hell, never one has ever seen 
a child in hell. Hell is adults only. Adults only. So, very interesting. He says he didn't see the rapture of the living saints, the living believers. And yet he reports in the same vision he didn't see anyone above the age of two. Now you might ask, well then, why are there children below the age of two? Because the tribulation is lasting at least three and a half years. So obviously during that time, some babies are born. Make sense? I mean, from the, from the second rapture takes place, another baby will pop out, right? And continue to pop out. So there will be babies, but here's what happens during the tribulation. Such evil. When the Christians are gone, all the people that hate Christianity, they don't realize what they're wishing for. When the salt of the earth is gone, that, that's preserving this, this decaying earth is gone. When our presence is gone, they always turn on babies. Even while we're here, they're turning on babies through abortion. Imagine when we're, when we're gone, it's not just abortion. It's not just, I don't want you up to the stage or the day of birth, right? Now, at least the sinners say, well, I've given birth to the baby, so I can't smash the baby's head or leave the baby on the side of a road to die of a heat stroke or just throw the baby in the garbage. I would be such a despicable, immoral human being because what? At least the Christians are preserving some sense of morality on the planet. But what's to say, if you don't believe in God, that, well, I've given birth, and I still hate the baby, and I like my life of pleasure, and I don't want to be responsible, and so in the chute, the baby goes on the sidewalk. So what happens during the tribulation that he saw, that is a very unusual detail that no one has ever really talked about, but it is an anti-scripture, is that babies will be abandoned everywhere. He said almost every corner there were babies being abandoned. It implies that all the young people who were alive at the time of the resurrection had been raptured. Babies are those who are born during the tribulation after the rapture. He also said that no one resisted the Antichrist. He never used the term Antichrist. Again, he didn't know those terms. He wasn't theologically trained, so he just spoke very, very plain. Um, but he said no one resisted this world leader, which implies a depopulation of the saints. Those who know the word, those who would stand firm on the word of God are all gone. So the Christians that are left are all immature Christians. And there's for sure a confirmation of what we preach about who gets raptured. That sermon is confirmed by this vision, but I didn't want to tell you about it yet because this vision is so startling. But uh, it's confirmed for sure after the uh, rapture occurs or the resurrection occurs, there are people who went to church and knew God but didn't walk with God. They remain. Okay, but I want to show you the scriptures when you look at um, who gets raptured. Okay, we do that for one hour. All right, the other question that we wanted to ask is, is this vision predictive? So there's nothing anti-scripture. It's very in line with the teaching that the resur resurrection of the dead happens first, the rapture of the saints happen uh, after, but together on the same day. All right, is this vision predictive? Here are some of the things that he saw that were unusual for him during that time in 1980. Ken Peter saw big screens in the middle of cities. Now remember back in those days, in the 1980s, um, General Electric had a commercial about here's their big screen TV, which is like small now for most people, right? And it was a clunker. It was a huge box. And my family was, I guess, you know, early adopters of technology. We had one of these clunkers. It was a big one. And you know, when you turn it on, it produced this, this uh, the three lights had to blend, you know? Remember that? Some of the older ones remember? Three lights. Young people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and the resolution would be like so poor compared to your smartphone and iPhone today. But we thought that was like the best. And this cost thousands of dollars back then. So, uh... Uh, we, we were, you know, moving up the scale of uh, lifestyle, and we had a big screen TV, one, you know, one was there. And people have to fight if they want to watch it, right? Now everybody's got their own screen. Now here's Philips uh, releasing their first flat screen commercial in 1998. Right? Now, the technology was there. People had been thinking about and doing it, but this was the first, like, kind of mass-produced, commercialized flat screen, and you look at it, it's still pretty thick compared to what 
uh, you guys have these days. But it hangs on a wall. And that was, you know, if you're an early adopter back in 1998, you might have gotten yourself one of those. But certainly in 1980, that wasn't common. And Ken Peters had not seen it. He said there were big screens. And they were not just in people's homes. They were outside uh, in the big cities. Well, guess what? We're living in it now. Go to any major city from London to New York to Tokyo, everywhere, there are big screens. I mean, never mind the big cities. You can drive down Moorabbin, Melbourne, and there's a big screen where the, the ad was, you know, uh, keeps changing. And uh, my wife just said to me, hey, look at this ad. And when I looked up, I said, what ad? And she's like, you know, like dummy, you know. I, she didn't say that, but I was too slow. I'm like, I don't see that ad. And she said, no, the screen had changed already. It's like a televised screen. I mean, that's in the middle of Moorabbin. That's just a little suburb. And there's a huge, you know, TV screen there. Well, he says uh, these things are going to be used, but at that time he, he had never seen them before. He also said back in 1980 that something unusual he was told is that TV had the ability to watch you and to monitor you. Now, did you know that TVs can watch us even if it's not turned on since 1992? Okay, the technology's been there. Some TVs could do that, but now every TV has a camera. Why do they do that? Is that for your benefit? Is that for your entertainment experience? No, they're creating the infrastructure that God has prophesied about, that God has predicted, a global mass control, mind control. That's what's happening. That's why we're fighting so much for freedom and free speech and freedom of religion, because it matters. As long as we're here, we're going to keep preserving the earth. But when we're gone, all these freedoms will erode like in a second. It will be such a sudden change. So the scary thing to him was that uh, it had the ability to watch you, and people thought that it had to be turned on, but later on, when he talked to some engineer friend of his, back in, in the 90s now, d a decade later, he said, an engineer told him, no, uh, all electronic devices work two ways, right? Everything works two ways. If it can turn on, it can turn off. If, it can go, you know, if a car can move forward, it can move backward. And uh, if a TV can uh, send signal, it can receive signal. Right? Or if it can receive signal, it can send signal. So it's always working two ways. Very interesting. Ken Peters also saw Humvees. He said these, these cars, these armored cars, he had never seen them before, but he saw them in the vision that Jesus gave to him in 1980. And he said that they uh, had guns uh, on the back, and there was somebody that was manning that gun, and they were just driving around cities, and they said they were very nice people, you know, they, they weren't rude, they weren't impolite, but they were there. They were there. Um, he saw that police cars had consoles that looked like airplane cockpits, he said there was even like a, a device with a screen that he had never seen before. Well, let me show you what a police console looks like these days. Right? Pretty elaborate now, isn't it? Not your regular car console. And what is that thing with the screen that he saw more than 30 years ago? A laptop. And many uh, law enforcement officers drive around with a laptop readily available for them to access what? Your data. When they pull you over, they already know most things about you. It will get worse in the tribulation. They will be monitoring you all the time. He saw another thing I didn't put up. I think it's very obvious. I don't have to put a picture up, um, but I can. I can for the video, which is he saw these oval, he said these oval cameras that were hung on street lamps. He said normally there should be just light there, but he says everywhere there are these oval black oval cameras. Well, guess what? We accept them now. You can go into a, a pizzeria and they have them. You go into an office and almost every corner has them recording you. Well, that's connected to a grid and that can be used by the government to track you and to monitor you. With facial recognition, they can know exactly where you are. Right? And what is, why do they do that? Right now they say it's for your benefit. It's for your peace. It's for your security. It's great. But when the tribulation comes, it will turn against you. That's the thing. They you know, they kind of boil the frog slowly, right? How do you boil a frog? You don't just throw a frog in boiling water because the frog whoosh, jumps out. But if you sit a frog in tepid water and turn up the heat slowly, it stays there and it dies. 
And that's how the devil is deceiving the masses. Unless you come to church, unless you're watching us on video or YouTube, really, you, you're already kind of in the mix of those who will follow the Antichrist. So if you know that God is calling you right now and you want to give your life to Jesus, I want to ask everyone here to stand and pray this prayer with me. If you're listening, you're watching, don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. Don't let the devil steal your soul. You didn't listen to all this to be tickled in your ear. God is calling you to salvation. How do you get saved? You must say sorry for your sin. The religious word is repent. You must repent and you must believe. That means you got to trust that Jesus can save you. He died on the cross, paid for your sins, he rose again. Please, concentrate, focus. Think on God right now and make this prayer your own prayer. Say this out of your mouth, out of your heart, and God will answer you and save you. Say this right now. Dear Lord, I'm not ready. I ask you to prepare me. Save my soul. Change my mind. Help me to live godly in this wicked world. I surrender totally. I put my faith in the cross of Jesus Christ. Not in my own good works. Not in my parents' religion. Not even in a church. I put my faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for defeating death and hell and Satan. Thank you for rising again after three days. You are, win you are a winner. And I accept you. I call you my champion, my leader, my savior. Now and forever, my life is yours. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. That's the prayer of salvation that is guaranteed. God saves you and washes your sin. Now, I don't mean to say that church can't save you, but I don't mean to put down church. Church is a family. It's imperfect, but it's a family of God. So you need to come to church or find church. If you don't have a church where you're at, treat us as your virtual church. All right, pray with us. Uh, give tithes, offerings to our ministry, and serve. Find a way to serve. I normally wouldn't say that, okay, because if you can find a good church locally, go to that church and send your tithe there. But if you can't find, you don't have to be forlorn. We will be your virtual church for as long as you need. So we're going to keep teaching the truth, pray for us, support us, and we're going to keep teaching you and helping you to grow up spiritually in the Lord. Amen.